So today, I'm going to be teaching you how to play a stripped-down version of the map-making game, The Quiet Year. The Quiet Year puts you, or a group of people, in charge of an encampment of survivors after the collapse of civilization. Why did it collapse? Well, I don't know. That's up to you and your group to decide. Assuming the role of either benevolent or malicious demigods, your group will determine how these survivors manage over a year. The game follows the transition of seasons, which, with each season, brings you closer to winter which is the end of the game. So what is The Quiet Year? Well, The Quiet Year is a map making game which was released by Avery Alder originally in 2013 with a new version coming out in 2019. It's still available to buy online, but we're going to be looking today at a stripped down version using some of the cards included within the game and teaching you how to play it. To play the game, all your group will need is a printout of the game cards, which can be purchased online, a number of dice, ideally D6s, paper, and some kind of mark-making tools, for example pencils, markers, pens, whatever you prefer, or whatever you have available to you. It should be noted that although this is a collaborative drawing game, there is absolutely no expectation of anything other than an ability to draw basic shapes. The map is drawn from a bird's eye perspective in whatever way or whatever manner you are comfortable with. With the basics put in place, let's have a look at how we set up for the beginning of the game and how the first couple of turns of the game runs. Okay, so within my class we're going to play a slightly stripped down version of the game using cards that are purchased and then put together on some different printout paper. So we've got different colours for each of the seasons which are in the game. We also have a basic reminder card which goes on, or we use for each week to try and figure out what the things are that we need to do. I've got my markers, got my paper, got my pencil, I've got everything. So let's see how we begin. First thing you're going to do is you're going to separate the cards into each of their piles. But we have yellow for spring, green for summer, pink for autumn, and then blue for winter. Okay. What we're going to do is we are just going to simply shuffle some of these cards up, and I'm just going to leave those off to the side. At the beginning of the game we'll have this nice wide piece of paper. Now again, for the context of playing within the classroom, what we're going to do is we are just going to divide about a quarter of the space with a line, um, and this is going to be where we record what happens in the game as we play through it. So I've got a nice clear area over there. Within this large map space, what we are going to do first of all is each member of the group is going to decide something that exists within this environment. Okay, so at the beginning of the game where we find ourselves or where the survivors find themselves, I have determined that they're beginning in a camp over here. So say for example, because you are set in the narrative that exists within this world that you're making, what I'm saying is maybe these guys travel in from this side, maybe <clears throat> they know in this area of the world there's nothing that is helpful for them, so they've moved, maybe they've had to move, maybe an event has happened which has caused them to leave, whatever they had behind, <clears throat> and now they've set up a small temporary camp next to a large running river. Now, the game is now ready to set up. Obviously, the more people you have in your group, the more things that are going to be on this map before you begin. Um, it is worth noting the things that you put on the map might be different features of the terrain, it might be some interesting points of interest um, that you have on the map, but try not to fill too much of the area in, okay? You've got to give yourself some room to add and to manipulate this map as you go. So we start with spring, so from the yellow cards for me, what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to flip over the top one. Okay, so what important and basic tools does the community lack or where are you storing your food? Why is this a risky place? So on almost all of the cards, what you'll find is a decision to make. You will have two different prompts. Say, for example, it will say, uh, you know, pick either this one or this one. And we're also going to record what happens down here. So for me, um, I think for this one, the one that I'm going to suggest is that what important or basic tools does the community lack? So say for example, what I might do over here where I'm going to record what's happening is I'm going to make a note of spring. This is the first card of spring. And I'm just going to write down basic tools missing. And I think this group is missing just basic tools for foraging. Foraging and building. So I can justify this with a group, I can talk about it a little bit further, I can try to explain why I think this is the case, um, and then 
It doesn't have to be a case of every member in the group agrees upon that. Just from my perspective, this is what I believe is happening. Okay. After we've read that from the card, what we're going to do is we're going to put this card over to one side. The second part of our turn comes from what we can notice on the action sheet. So we have two actions. So this is, again, a stripped down version of the Quiet Year game, which provides you with free actions you can do on a turnly basis. But the actions we can determine or choose from here are to discover something new or to start a project. Let's give an example of what both of these would look like, but you can do one per turn. Discover something new. Let's say, for example, in a narrative sense, maybe someone from the camp is wandering around late at night and they notice somewhere in the distance there is maybe some lights that they can see. Maybe it's lights from some buildings, maybe it's lights from, I don't know, a cave or something. And what I can do if I choose to discover something new is I can choose to add something to the map. The start a project might reflect what has happened in the turn. So my starter project here might be that members of the camp are going to go into the local area, maybe they're going to try and get across to the deep dark woods, they're going to get some basic materials necessary to build some of these tools. And in fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to make a note, I'm going to put project, build some tools. As a group, decide its duration. So how long in weeks would it take a group to do this? Now, as I'm by myself, this is going to be slightly easier, and I'm going to say it's going to take two weeks to make some rudimentary tools. Next to my project icon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my dice at the number two, and as I move through the turns, this will start to tick down, and then when it gets to zero, I will then determine, as the person who started the project, how that plays out and what happens. So there's a disquieting legend about this place, what is it? Or an alarming weather patterns destroy something, how and what? And the legend is that there are ghosts in the local unexplored house. I'm going to indicate this on the map, a really terrible rendition of a ghost, and then make a note of it over here. Now the reason I think it's important to make a note of this as you go through is because narratively it then, as you, if you have to step away from the game and you have to come back, it provides you or your group an opportunity to read through and see what, what's happened. It also provides a little bit of context for what has happened to the community as you've gone through your quiet year. I think it's a really interesting idea and I think this is where some of the potential of the game lies. Okay, I'm going to my actions now. Um, so I'm going to discover something new. I'm going to say the rumors or the disquieting legend about the ghosts in the house over here have prompted people to maybe want to explore this area a little bit more. And I'm going to say, as some people have started to wander down the river, what they've noticed is a series of stepping stones on the river. I'm just going to make a note, stepping stone bridge. So that's an example of discovering something new and what that might look like on the map, so it's something which permanently can change the map and something that can be utilized afterwards. Let's take this down for one. This is one week remaining on this. Draw one more card. There's a large body of water on the map. Where is it? What's it look like? Or there's a giant man-made structure on the map. Where is it? Why is it abandoned? Okay, we already have this giant river, so I don't think we need another large body of water. However, there is a giant man-made structure on the map. Where is it? And why is it abandoned? A sawmill. You have to think the worlds that you're making here don't necessarily have to be rooted within what we have available to us. It can be based within a fantasy setting. You can set those kinds of limitations to it. So what is it? where is it and why is it abandoned? So we have our abandoned sawmill, or at least what some people in the community can recognize as a sawmill. Why is it abandoned? Well, maybe that's the mystery and they're not sure, which could then prompt a project. So if I go, Third card, man-made structure, investigate the sawmill. Okay, so again, as a group, you would determine or decide how long that this would take. I'm gonna say for the people to move maybe from the camp, either swimming across or going all the way down to the Stone River and then going up, that's probably gonna take quite a little bit of time. So I'm gonna say this is a four week project which takes place. Right, after determining the project, then we tick any of the other projects down. This one is now finished, so let's have a look at how this project wraps up. So build some tools. So again, the person who started the project is the one who determines how it ultimately ends up. So how does this project end up? My guys have some, something available to them that they can use. Okay, and that's essentially how the game runs.
Each turn, each person takes a turn to take a card from the deck to determine something that happens based upon that card and then chooses to either start a project or make a discovery. I'm going to have a little bit of a time lapse to show how this would work out for the, another few turns so you can see how the map might develop and how things might shift or change. an interesting point to check in and then this is going to be where we leave it because we have a number of projects that are just about to tick down. Now again I'm going to remind you that the person who starts the project is the one who determines its outcome um, and this can both be positive or negative so let's talk through how some of this stuff resolves. Uh, first of all let's do the easy one so this ticks down to three as uh, so this project which we're not necessarily going to find the end of in this game but is find the couple explore the house so this was prompted by the card saying uh, that someone goes missing uh, who which i said was maybe a young couple went across into an unexplored house and then they've gone missing so it started a project to explore the house and figure out where they've gone Okay, working our way back up here. This is that we didn't necessarily have any food within this environment, and you might have also noted that sharks have been added to the river um, based upon a natural predators within the environment prompt. So let's say that we are able to successfully build some fishing nets by the side of the river so that we can start to catch some fish. Because obviously if there's predators in the environment, it must mean that there is food for them to eat. So fishing, nets, so that's a success. So let's see what else can happen. Okay, we are gonna go to the next one. So this was a piece of ancient machinery that was discovered, um, potentially fixable. Uh, so this is the broken boat which was introduced over here. So what I'm gonna say as part of this, um, again, giving you an example that you do not necessarily have to be a good influence on this map or even that certain people may choose not to be. I'm going to say, that this project here, people are wandering around and disaster strikes. Maybe, say for example, it has been here for a very, very long time and moving around and trying to explore and see what is going on within this environment has caused different parts of the boat to collapse into the river or to be taken away by the stream. So what I'm gonna do to indicate this is I'm just gonna put a large cross through the boat to indicate it is either now ruined or maybe it's been taken somewhere down the river as it's kind of fallen back in. So broken boat is now destroyed ruins. Or destroyed ruins of boat. And finally, last one. So a man-made structure was, was discovered on the map. This was a sawmill project. Investigate the sawmill. Let's say, for example, we imagine our people have gone all the way across over here. Let's, we've given them a positive. Uh, what was positive? The nets. A negative. Let's make this one a positive as well. And let's just say the sawmill is no longer abandoned. And that it is potentially usable. And this is going to be where we end it. And we're going to leave it there. So a pretty interesting start to our map that so we've managed to go do that by moving through spring and into the summer season. So again the game progresses spring, summer, autumn, winter till the end of the game which is a card which is triggered within winter which will determine the end of the game. Okay. This game can be really, really interesting for a variety of different reasons. Whether you're a student, a teacher, or just someone who has discovered this, this game can prompt creativity. It can draw connections between creative writing or just ways in which we might consider uh, fictional pieces of writing within our own imagination and how we can choose to start indicating those through drawings on maps as well. The maps themselves can be really, really useful um, and it can be a good skill to develop in many ways. There are a number of people who make their living now by selling D&D maps on Etsy, for example, so this could be a way to develop that skill. You also could become a fantasy illustrator. So if you look at fantasy books or you look at different authors who put together fantasy novels, if you open up the first pages, generally there tend to be some maps in there which could be utilized and this could be a skill that develops that goes towards that. Um, it can also be utilized, say for example, if you want to try and tap into your latent creativity. Say for example, you want to do a little bit of writing yourself, but you want to try and establish this world. Come over with a set of rules, you know, who are these survivors, why are they here? 
and then let's have a look and see why they exist within this world and what's going on in this world. And then as you start to explore through this quiet year, you'll naturally just develop, oh, okay, maybe there's a kind of animal that exists in this world, or maybe there's a kind of magic exists, or there's the crystals, which then, you know, people have a bad response to. And that will just try to encourage you a little bit more in the direction of accessing your own creativity and utilizing it for a variety of different ways. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope if you're able to play this that you enjoy it, and I look forward to seeing what you come up with.